Good afternoon, radio audience, and again, as always, I want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Unadulterated Radio Truth broadcast, a broadcast that is a live Bible question and answer program where you, uh, the radio audience, at any point in time, you have the opportunity afforded to you to pick up your phones, dial the number 281-837-2222 if you have any Bible questions, comments you'd like to make, and we'll give you book, chapter, verse for all of your Bible questions. Love to listen to your comments as well. We're going to deal with the subject of the good and evil that comes from money. The good and the evil that comes from money. Again, the numbers two eight one eight three seven twenty two twenty two. First Timothy chapter th uh, six and verse three. The Bible says, "If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness." Paul says, "From such withdraw yourself." But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many with many sorrows. I've just read into your hearing 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 10. Again, 281 2222 Our subject, the good and evil that comes from money. At this time, my brother Javier Frias. Amen. God bless you, brother Henry. You too, my brother. God bless you. Audience, we pray that you're listening to this subject. Very important subject we're going to talk about. We're going to open up the scriptures to look at the mind of God, the mind of Christ. And to see this subject, uh, some of you wake up for this, and this all you live for is the money. Some of you wake up to provide for your families. Uh, this is the reason why you wake up, is to help your family, those in the congregation. We want to look at this little thing called money and what the Bible says about it. Not what we think, but what the Bible says. Luke chapter 7, looking at verse 2. The Bible says in this particular verse, And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loved our nation, and he had built us a synagogue. So this gentleman, he loved the nation of Israel. He, he loved the people of God. And what the Bible says in verse 5 is that he built unto them a synagogue. He had his mindset concerning the funds that he accumulated in his lifetime. And he said, you know what, I want to... Uh, build something for the people of God, for them, so they can go and, and study God's Word, so they can learn of God. And so concerning the heart and the mind, uh, what money does is it exposes who you really are, whether you have little or whether you have a lot. This man's mindset was to build a synagogue for God. Your mindset may be to maybe purchase tracts for the congregation, maybe help a brother or sister or a widow in need uh, with the money that you used to work with, or others of you may desire to purchase more cocaine. Maybe mm. go to Las Vegas, purchase hookers. Maybe you desire to uh, purchase things that you shouldn't be purchasing, pornography videos and magazines. Maybe you have a desire to, to do different sins with the funds that you've accumulated. What does it mention concerning the prodigal son when he received his funds? He went to a far city to go sin with the funds that he received uh, of his father. If you look at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 6, looking at verse 19, the Bible gives a specific detail. This is coming from the mouth uh, of Jesus Christ and what he instructed all men on what they should do. Verse 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also and we have to on this life we have to labor until Christ returns and when it comes to the treasure that you're accumulating you either accumulating wrath or accumulating treasure into the heavens that's stored for you and you will receive an inheritance in the future looking at the scriptures concerning Acts chapter 8 looking at verse 18 Acts 8 verse 18 the Bible says in this particular verse uh, when it comes to the gentleman named Simon. Verse 18, he got baptized. It says, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, 
saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part, part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Some of you may think, that you can buy the grace and favor of God through tithing, through the teaching of tithing, which was of the Old Testament. Remember, Simon, he was a sorcerer. He bewitched many. He gave out that himself was some great one. In verse number 10, all gave he from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is a great power of God. And he did favors for them. He did works for them in his past as a sorcerer. But he got baptized, born again, Peter had to tell him in verse 22, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. So when it comes to those who teach tithing, understand that that's a false teaching today. It's been cru crucified to the cross. You can't buy your way into God's loving protection or his grace through tithing. That's the old covenant commandment. We are Amen. to give from the heart unto God and to his kingdom. Acts chapter 16, looking at verse 16, there was another woman who <clears throat> was following Paul for several days. Acts 16, looking at verse 16, it says, It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So she was soothsaying and brought a lot of money, and the same followed Paul and us and Christ, saying, These men are the servants of of the Most High God, which show us unto us the way of salvation. This did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of, came out the same hour, and when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. Now, <clears throat> here we have this woman making money. Guess who is the money-making motivator? Is the demon that was inside of her. Some of you are making money with these fortune-telling locations because you have a demon that is empowering you to soothsay and flip these cards and give predictions, give fortunes to these different people around Houston, around the world that you're teaching and communicating with concerning the power of the satanic force that is bringing in the money for you. You have to trade that in, be born again, have that spirit removed, and receive the Holy Spirit that you can get treasure in the heavens. Look at Acts chapter 11. Looking at verse number 28, there was a dearth. And in verse 28, there stood one of them named Agabus, signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it unto the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So the title, the good and evil that, that comes from money, the good that they had in their heart to give relief unto the saints. We're going to use this money to send the relief so they can eat, so they can provide for their families at this time because there is a dearth, there is a need a help that is needed for this congregation, which is a help that should be done today in, in the church if there's ever a need, whether it be India or our brothers in here in the States. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. He's talking about wisdom, discretion. So shall there be life unto thy soul and grace unto thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. Money is always going to fly. It's always going to come and go. But you have to keep wisdom and discretion, as we mentioned, in the heavens. Uh, Proverbs 23, verse 5. But thou set thine eyes upon that which is not for riches, certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an evil toward, eagle toward heaven. So understand that. It's going to come and go. But where will your soul be at the judgment day? Will you be ushered in and have a welcome? What shall a profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a profit? Is the money that you're making, whether legally or illegally, is it worth your soul? Whether you don't want to fight for Sundays off, you don't want to seek after God and worship Him. First Thessalonians 
chapter number 5. Looking at verse 10, the Bible says, Who died for us that, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you, and the Lord that admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and to be at peace among yourselves. The work that we do in the kingdom, we're working together. We're uh, accumulating treasure, spiritual treasure together, that we will have a reward. The reason why you work every single day is to have for your necessities, uh, for your family, uh, for yourself. It is not to be used for evil, uh, for drug use, for prostitution, uh, to be used in a way for gambling that is contrary to God's word. First Timothy chapter 5. Looking at verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So that means if you're working, you don't provide the money for your family. The Bible calls you worse than an infidel, even though you are a Christian. Even though you are a Christian, you are called worse than an infidel, according to the scriptures. Look at Luke. Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, but you say, well, I got the Holy Ghost. I come to church, I sing, I pray, I do the Lord's Supper. But you mean this little green thing in my pocket, if I don't provide for my own, I'm worse than an infidel? Amen. That's what the scriptures teach. The Bible is telling you what it's to be used for, the good that it's to be used for. Luke chapter 16, verse 9, And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Now, when it comes to being friends, it's not dealing with friends uh, of the world where you sin with them, but your friends to communicate with them so you can be able to labor and provide for your family. Amen. Verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If ye, if therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous man, who will commit to you your truths, your trust, the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So what does this teach you? God is to be first. Above mammon. Man. God is to be first. Some men put money above God. And so their mindset is, man, I love going to work to make more money. I'd rather do overtime. But when it comes to communicating subjects of the Bible or subjects that need to be taken care of, that God desires to be taken care of, you desire to get out of there as soon as possible and leave out early. Because you don't desire to work in righteousness. You don't desire to deal with the things of God to resolve the problems, if there be any, because your heart's desire and your mind is in this world, Man. and you only seek for earthly things. Remember, audience, that this world is a fleeting vapor. Your life is a fleeting vapor, and the soul has to return to him who gave it. The number to call is 281 I've heard a wonderful explanation Amen. about Amen. the good and the evil that comes uh, uh, from money. Uh, I want to go to Luke chapter 18, if we could, just real quickly. Luke chapter 18 to give an example uh, here of a uh, uh, what we call the rich young ruler, uh, to uh, Javier's point, if we could, beginning in Luke chapter 18. And I want to read uh, verse 18, and listen what the Bible says. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Jesus tells him, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. So notice what Jesus does here. Jesus uh, first deals with this individual based upon uh, what his attitude should be towards man. And so notice Jesus doesn't call out uh, any of the Ten Commandments that starts with the relationship that he should have with God. And so Jesus says, you know the commandments, you know, this is how you treat your neighbor, you know, you love your neighbor as yourself. And so notice what the young man said in verse 21, he said, all these have I kept 
uh, from my youth up. And so he understands I've been treating people like I want to be treated. Now, many of you will look at that and say, man, this guy's all right, man. He's treating everybody right, giving of his money. You know, he ain't sleeping around with nobody's wife. He hadn't murdered nobody. He's not stealing, you know. He doesn't need to steal. He's, he's been blessed, you know, physically by, by God, the blessings of God. And so now, now Jesus, the Bible tells us in verse 22, when Jesus heard these things, he said to them, yet lackest thou one thing. Mm. Sell all you have and distribute unto the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful. Why? For he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? He said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And Amen. Jesus said, lo, we've left all and follow you. And he said unto them, verily I say unto you, there is no man that had left house, parents, brother, and wife, children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Now notice what Jesus did with this young individual. And I want you to make sure you understand this. Jesus knows all of our hearts. God knows every heart of every individual in this world. This young man had uh, uh, did some, some uh, physical things uh, that were right, but what Jesus does is he brings him face to face with his true God. And his true God was money. That's who his true God was. He loved money more than he loved the things of God. And so what's the point? Well, the point that Jesus is showing us is that, as Brother Javier even explained, money can become your idol. You can love money, worship money, put money uh, before God, and because you put your trust and your faith in money rather than God, you can lose your soul's salvation. Oh, Let me tell you something. This was this man's problem. Now, I've heard some devils in the church. I remember the old thing I was talking about this last week or sometime. I heard some devils in the church say, well, God, Jesus wouldn't have really, you know, made him sell it. All he had to do was say, you know, okay, I'll sell it. And then, and then God, Jesus would tell him to go ahead and keep it. Now, you know how, I want to know, first of all, 281-837-2222, how you know that, first of all. What scripture uh, supports that thought? And then secondly, if this is something that's keeping him out of heaven, why wouldn't Jesus make him sell it? Yeah. See, that may not be your problem with money. It may not be something God is requesting and it's not something he's requesting everybody to do. The sin is not being rich. The sin is not having money. Uh, having money. The sin is when the money has you. Amen. When you start trusting in it, working for Amen. it, living for it, then that's when it becomes your God and that's when you have a problem with God. Amen. And so you got to be very honest with yourself and understand whether you're in the church or out of the church, you can have a spirit of covetousness. And let me say this while we're in the neighborhood too. And this is to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I want you to know something. You can tell and should be able to tell when you have brothers and sisters who are in the church who are covetous. Let me make sure you make sure we understand. So you have some, oh, you can't judge me. No, your actions, we can judge. And based upon your actions and, and, and what you're putting first, we can, in fact, tell and determine that you are a covetous individual. Now, let me give you a scripture to back it up Amen. since I said it. Go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to go here. Now, 1 Corinthians 5, what we have here is we had an individual, a young man who was sleeping with his father's wife. Well, uh, the saints, when he gathered with them, they were puffed up about it. Uh, they were puffed up about him. We'll take you just a second, caller. Who were puffed up about it. Uh, they didn't withdraw for him. Uh, Peter said, hand him over to Satan. Uh, Paul, rather, hand him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, uh, that his soul might be saved. Uh, in the day of, of Jesus' return. Yeah. But I want you to notice with me, as we're talking about covetousness, notice here with me what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want you to read with me in verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul says, I wrote unto you in epistles not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. Notice what he says. Or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then you must need go out of the world. 
So he's saying, as Christians, you're in the world, but we're not of the world. We understand the world. If you, we got people who are extortioners, idolaters, they worship different gods, and and people are covetous. He Paul, Paul is saying, I'm not saying that you don't, you can't be around them. So now look what he's saying though in verse 11. But now I've written unto you, not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother. Now get this, be a fornicator. Now get this, or covetous, or an idolater or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. He says, with such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? And so the key word I want you to see here is covetous. Paul says, when you have people in your congregation who are practicing the sin of covetousness, you are to address that particular individual's lifestyle. Amen. And so, as Brother Javier brought up, if you have the individual, all they want to do is work, 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 uh, worry about, you know, and again, you got to work, but you have to balance that thing. You have to, as Christians, we got to know how to navigate ourselves through this life uh, and put things in proper perspective. And so when you have individuals, all they want is overtime, work, 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 uh, and, and, and at the sake of neglecting the business, of the people of God and the things and their responsibilities and duties spiritual that God has given them, then uh -huh. that lets us know that that individual is covetousness, and we need to help them to see the error of their way. 281-837-2222. We have a caller on the line. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Uh, I have no question, but it seems like the audio went down about three minutes ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's my line. I'll check to see if it's on my end, but double check your end. Thank you so much, Brother Dave, and appreciate you listening in, and we'll see what we can do to address that. And if if not, y'all, please uh, let us know, okay? And so, again, we've been dealing with the subject matter, the good and the evil that comes uh, from money. Now, we've got about five minutes left, and before I talk to the Brother uh, Oda, I want to I wanna address something uh, on the previous program. Greg Griffin showed just real quick, and he knew I was going to address it because I heard him say that we were going to come behind him and do damage control, and he's exactly right. I am going to do damage control on the lie of the doctrine that he teaches about the necessity of baptism. Now, notice what he said. He, this is what Greg said in the last program. He said, baptism is not a necessity for the simple fact that baptism is only mentioned nine times in the book of Acts, but 23 times people were added to the church, uh, he says, uh, prior to getting baptized. And so baptism is something that you do after you get saved. Now, let me show you how ridiculous that Greg Griffin's doctrine is. In 2A1837-2222, this is how ridiculous his doctrine is. His doctrine, let me, it, it teaches like this. There's 143 times the word belief is in the Bible. 143. Only 46 times we see the word repent. So based on Greg's doctrine, the thing you really have to do to be saved is just believe more than to repent. That's his, that's his position. You guys are clear. Okay, and then he also says, he also says, uh, his doctrine teaches this, that, well, since 69 times we have the word obey, you know, obey God, that's only 69 times, and the word uh, uh, fornication, now notice this, the word fornication is 36 times in the Bible. I'm just using his argument, his logic. The word fornication in the Bible is 36 times, and the word marriage in the Bible is 19 times. So because there's more words to say fornication in the Bible, and only marriage 19 times, I can fornicate because it's only uh, 19 times the Bible says marriage. Mm. That's Greg's teaching. That's, That's exactly what Greg is saying. And so Greg, because he does not have the spirit, he does not have, know how to put line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter 2, because Greg did read Acts chapter 2, but because he doesn't have the spirit, he ran all over Acts chapter 2 and lied on Peter and the apostles. I'm going to prove to you that he lied. And for those of you who are wondering, well, I didn't hear him say that I got him recorded. I recorded Greg. So I got it, and I'll play it back for you if you got a problem with me addressing his false doctrine. Now, notice what he said, Greg said, Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 37. Now, now when they heard this, because what happened was the apostles preached uh, the gospel on the day of Pentecost. All nations are there. The Holy Spirit falls only on the apostles is who he falls on. And only the apostles, the 12 men, are speaking in tongues, not the 120, not the women in the other room. Now, in Acts 2.37, the Bible said, now when they heard this, they heard the God, they were pricked in the heart, said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. He tells them why, Greg, for the remission of sins, 
and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, there is nothing they have to do, Greg, and those who teach this doctrine. Why would Peter waste his breath to tell them to save themselves from this untoward generation? Mm -hmm. If it's just belief only, listen to me, radio audience, and I'm trying to say this as, 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 as in much love as I possibly can. If it's belief only, they already believe in verse 37. This is why they're asking, what must we do? Amen. Because they believe what Peter and the apostles said about who Jesus was and why Jesus was crucified. They believe that already. So if, they, if, it's, if salvation is at the point of belief, why is Peter opening his mouth and telling them to save themselves from this untoward generation? Now, notice what they do. Then verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added in 3,000 souls. Now look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly, get this, in the apostles' doctrine. You know what Greg said? Greg says that the book of Acts is not an, a doctrinal book. That's what he teaches. I like to ask Greg, then what are Peter and the apostles teaching here? Isn't this doctrine? Isn't it, the word doctrine simply means teaching. That's what it means. It means teaching. And so they are teaching what Jesus told them to teach. And when these people got baptized, 3,000 souls. They continued steadfastly in the apostle doctrine, fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayer. And fear came upon every uh, 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 upon every soul. Many ones of the side were done by the apostle. All that believed were together, had all things common, sold their possession good, parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, ate their meat with gladness, sing those heart. Now look at verse 47. Praising God and having faith with all of you. And the Lord added to the church. What church was it? The church of Christ. The church Jesus said he was going to build daily, such as should be saved. It doesn't get any plainer than that, radio listeners. Amen. Greg's doctrine is off. If you believe Greg and if you believe Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes, you're going to die lost, Amen. radio listeners. Believe me, you'll die lost. The Bible is right. Greg and those who teach this doctrine is wrong. We hope uh, that you listen in. If you have any questions, we hope you tune in next week. We want to lead the faithful saints of God with Romans 16, 16. The churches of Christ salute oh, you. Already. Question for, uh, you know, so, uh, so Griffin, Griffin is, is uh, we know he's teaching false doctrine when it comes to uh, you know baptism, other stuff. He's talking about trying to discredit, uh, you know, what the Bible says concerning uh, being baptized. You know, uh, you just point out Acts two thirty eight. That's one example. And there are other biblical examples we can read about uh, in in uh, in reference to uh, baptism, but. You know, the denominational folks, they say you have to confess and ask God to come into your heart and then God will come and save you, you know. And so they're trying to tell God to do something that he's not going to do because that is not in his plan. He's not going to save no man unless action is going to have to take place because there's an action that is required because you have to have contact with Christ's blood. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, this is a great commission. 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. Verse 16 says, He that believeth. Amen. Now, so now, now, let, let me ask you something. Can you be saved if you don't believe it just, and still be baptized? Oh, that is an impossibility hey, because it goes together. You have to believe. Man. It says, man. he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So you can see those two components go hand in hand. God bless you. You man. cannot be saved one without the other. Hey, you man. must believe. He man. that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So there's damnation if you don't do what it says in verse five, in uh, verse 16. If Amen. you do what verse 16 says, you will, you shall be saved. But if not, there's always a but because it changes that thought that if you don't do what it says in verse 16, there's going to be damnation for you if you don't obey 
he that believeth, that's the faith, and is baptized shall be saved. But it says, he that believeth not shall be damned. Amen. 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 Good teacher. Brother, when it comes to Acts, he says it's not a doctrinal book. Acts 5, 28, they said, we straightly commanded you, don't teach in his name. He said, you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine. Amen. Acts 5, thir Acts 13, 12, when the deputy, he saw what was done, believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Amen. Same thing, Acts 17, 19, they took him and brought him unto your pagan, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. And so doctrine was being taught all through the book of Acts. And so what he's doing is he's looking at the numbers of belief, numbers of baptism, and he's in his mind, he's saying, well, there's more of this than this, so this must be right. But he's not rightly dividing Amen. the scriptures in his context to define what did they do and what did they believe. Because you, after you get baptized, you have to continue to believe. Amen. God after you get baptized. Amen. So he, he's playing a childish game when it comes to numbers of the words yes. and how much times they're uh, listed in the scripture. Amen. God bless you, Javier. That's good, man. God bless you. That's good work. Good scriptures, man, that define. God bless you. Excellent work. Excellent work. If, if these brothers will continue to do this on the earth, we'll get souls to the law. But sometimes people have fear that they're not going to have a following anymore, like Jeroboam. I don't know what great fear is that makes him not want to acknowledge English words. He's a very intelligent man. The point is, is that you can't be afraid of a following. You don't have a following. We are the followers of Christ. And you don't worry about if somebody is going to not follow you. Because you're supposed to be followed as you follow Christ. So you keep following Christ. That's all that counts. So God help him and others, man. You know, it's very discouraging to see human beings die lost after Christ died for us, you know. But that's the choice we have to make. The thing you, know? you should be fearful of is, 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 uh, is uh, hell. Because uh, exactly. if you don't change, you know, his belief system and what he believed in, that's where he's going to be headed if he don't make a change now before yeah. he closes his eyes. He's going to, you know, it's going to be damnation for him. So that's, sad. that's the greatest fear that we all have is not seeing God's face in peace. Exactly. And then be turned away and be lost eternally forever. Not exactly. being able to see God's face, not seeing the angels. Be lost in a devil's hell. That, right. That's a hor horrific. Yeah. That would be Hard. a horrible verdict from the Lord on the day of judgment for us to see him, but not in peace. And it's, exactly. it's, it's anger. Mm -hmm. We'll be displeased exactly. and then turn us away. Yeah. But why would we want to go, go through this? We had to see about a devil, man. So that's why know? it moves yeah. us to, to, to do all we can to make sure that God is pleased with works that we're offering unto him. Exactly. You know, and, and, and you know, Paul says, you know, every man is persuaded in his own mind. Mm -hmm. So you can believe something or do you, are you fully persuaded what you believe? Mm -hmm. Greg Griffin is fully persuaded that he's teaching. He's not fully persuaded that he's teaching about that. He mm -hmm. thinks he's not. Yeah, yeah. But we know he is. Exactly. But so we're fully persuaded knowing he's teaching false doctrine. Exactly. And he's leading those who he is teaching astray. Yes. The blind yeah. shall lead the blind, and they both shall fall. That's what I said. Good scripture. So a, a, a blind leader, he cannot lead those who are following him because he's blind himself. If he can't yeah. see, yes. the ones that are following him are not going to see either. That's why Christ said it was a warning. Yeah, yeah and there's a warning that's impossible to get around. Good job, my brother. God bless you, Kevin. Appreciate you, man. Good work. A frizz.